I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty, so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... William Shatner, and the eternal question of, did he kill his wife? Who is William Shatner? Well, he's an iconoclast 92-year-old thespian known equally for his halting speech pattern and tireless work ethic as he is for his beloved turns in the roles of James D. Kirk, T.J. Hooker, and the Priceline Guy. However, in 1999, the Canadian icon's life took a left turn when his third wife, Noreen Shatner, was found dead, drowned in their Studio City home's pool. Shatner's personal tragedy would spawn a media circus that would leave some members of the public suspicious that Shatner may have been involved. boldly go somewhere. William Shatner is probably most widely recognized as the iconic captain of the good ship Enterprise, James T. Kirk. I believe my first memory of him is when my grandmother taped Star Trek IV The Voyage Home off of TV for me, thinking it was, quote unquote, a Star War. Did I devour the grainy extra legal bootleg VHS? Yes. Did I have any idea what was happening? No, not really. Why was this Spock dude just kicking it in a bathrobe the whole time? One of the great mysteries of the universe. Shatner, despite being a Canadian, has been a fixture of American life for close to six decades. As his career has ebbed and flowed, he's continually managed to reinvent, recontextualize, and evolve as an artist to make sure that he's always had enough money to buy more horses. Born March 22, 1931 in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, William Shatner grew up in the Notre Dame de Grace neighborhood. His parents, both conservative Jewish people, were named Anne and Joseph. His father was a clothing manufacturer. Despite forging a career playing leaders and charismatic, quote-unquote, oldest son energy characters, William is actually the middle of three children and the only boy. Shatner's career began while he was in college. In 1951, he had a small role in the Canadian comedy The Butler's Night Off. After graduating from McGill University, where he was studying economics, he worked at the Mountain Playhouse and Canadian National Repertory Theatre in Ottawa. This led him to join the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Ontario, which opened the door to his Broadway debut in 1956. As the 50s wound to a close, Shatner decided to move to New York City full-time. Upon moving, he found work on both stage and screen, appearing in The Howdy Doody Show, numerous Broadway productions, and even appearing in his first major Hollywood picture, MGM's The Brothers Karamazov. In 1959, Shatner would appear as Lomax in The World of Susie Wong on Broadway, and he landed his first TV starring role as Archie Goodwin in the Nero Wolf TV series. However, the show was canceled after just the pilot and a few episodes were shot. And here's where we get to the first of Shatner's breakout performances his two Twilight episodes, The Nick of Time in 1960 and Nightmare at 20,000 Feet in 1963. Spandrew, what's your your first exposure to Old Dirty Bill? Yeah, I was going to say before we got to this part that, uh, I I mean, I think my first exposure is definitely that he's, that he was Captain Kirk. Um, But I think like when I, when I was much younger and when I first kind of became aware of him as Captain Kirk, I think it was less like I started becoming interested in Star Trek a little later on. So early on, my exposure to him was just that he that that ubiquitous pop culture iconography of Captain Kirk. But I wasn't necessarily like a fan. I don't think I watched much Star Trek when I was very young. But I think my first real exposure to him was um, those two episodes of of Twilight Zone, specifically Nick of Time. Um, the one where he like goes back in time to, I think he, he goes back in time to when Lincoln was assassinated or, and then he goes back in time to another time period. Um, though th- basically I saw those two episodes and I was like, oh yeah, it's like Captain Kirk and he's in this. And I thought that was kind of interesting because as a kid, I, you know, I, I just didn't intellectualize that somebody could be younger and be in other things before they were in like a big TV role. I just thought of it as like, you just 
came out of the ether fully formed as whatever you were. So it was like fascinating to me that Captain Kirk was in these movies that or, or in these shows that were black and white. So they were like before Star Trek, even if that wasn't wasn't necessarily true. But that was the way I thought of it. I mean, Nightmare of, uh, at 20,000 feet is the most famous episode of Twilight Zone. I like it fine. Um, but I really like that other episode with with uh, with. William Shatner, Nick of Time. That's a, that's a good episode. It's not my favorite, but I like that episode. Yeah, I mean, Nightmare on tw- at Twenty Thousand Feet is just so iconic. Um, you know, the, there's some thing out of the way. You know, like yeah, I mean, parodied a million times. Probably like the origin of that William Shatner impression. Uh, I feel like we should watch a little bit of it just so the audience can hear. Uh, even though everybody's probably familiar with Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. Um, I feel like it's worth just hearing a little bit of him. I shouldn't have taken that sleeping pill. I should stay awake with you. No, no, no. I don't want you to, sweetheart. Go back to sleep. I'm all right. Can't you sleep? I will. Don't worry about me. Freaking out, staring at the window, and sees this weird little gremlin guy walking on the wing. Yeah, this this very specific style of of horror, like it's simultaneously, like it's 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 good, but also I find some humor in it. Uh, where and there's there's like there's so many different things that have done something like this, um, particularly like older cinema. Where like the horror is that you just like look out a window or look somewhere and there's just like some kind of like beastie just like standing there looking at you. And like that's what that's the entire conceit is that you look somewhere and there's just like a monster just like standing there looking at you, just not doing anything. They don't chase you, but they're just standing there looking at you that that like that that particular style of horror where it's like, hey, there, I'm an evil monster, but, but I look but I look scary to you. I believe the the genre, the subgenre is called Hey There Beasties. It would be three years later that Shatner would land the role of a lifetime in 1966 second Star Trek pilot, Where No Man Has Gone Before. The part was originally offered to Jack Lord, but he turned it down, and then to Jeffrey Hunter, and then was eventually recast with our boy Bill. Just to go into that a little deeper, I really, I never had much, I, I was aware of Star Trek, but I never really watched it. Um, I don't know why. I mean, I guess maybe just I didn't just have access to watching it. Just wasn't coming on any channels I was watching or something like that. And then later on, uh, when I was a little bit older, maybe like maybe when I was like 10, 10 12 or something like that, um, my uncle was really into TNG and he just like made, had me watch all kinds of TNG episodes. And he gave me a bunch of TNG trading cards, which I still have to this day. They're in a they're in a binder over there with a bunch of my other trading cards. And then I started to become interested in Star Trek. And then I watched more. I watched, you know, the original series and became interested in the property. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, the, my first Star Trek was Star Trek four. Um, it was actually technically Star Trek four and five. Uh, for whatever reason, my grandma taped them off of TV because she thought they were a Star War. And then after that, I had a VHS uh, of just one episode. Uh, it was the Gary Lockhart episode. I don't know how we ended up with that single VHS, but we had that Gary Lockhart episode. And then I also got obsessed with TNG before it was like available on home video, just, you know, when it was in syndication, just when it was in syndication and stuff. Um, and then I kind of fell off of it. I went back and watched some of the original series, fell off of it around the DS9 Voyager Enterprise era, and then came back when it when all of that stuff kind of like ended i came back to star trek uh and i i mean i saw random episodes of voyager and ds9 on tv but they didn't for whatever reason connect uh when i was watching them as a kid as much and then i went back and watched all of them and uh now i am an acolyte i love the trek that was so like half-hearted i know i know you have like no energy to be like 
to like go total fanboy in this episode. <laughs> like you, you, you've spent all of your energy in the prisoner episode. And now you can't like muster that energy anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, but I love Star Trek. I'm a hardcore Star Trek person. As people who listen to the show know, I have worked on the Star Trek comics. Uh, I I love Star Trek. <laughs> Just I don't I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You're not selling it. As everybody knows, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I love it. <laughs> Look, man, we're recording in the morning. You're recording in the morning. Recording in the morning. I'm a little sleepy, guys. I'm a little. I'm just a little baby. I'm a little baby sleepy guy. You know. I just want to be cozy. Dave's just standing in the in, n- near me through a doorway and just going. Bet you're a little scared now. Bet you're scared seeing this little Davy. This little Davy just standing here in the shadows. You like Star Trek? I love Star Trek. You want to watch some TNG? Over the course of the show, Shatner would create his signature style of over-the-top acting, theatrical pauses, and energetic staccato pronunciations. The show lasted 79 episodes and redefined what science fiction could be for the mainstream consciousness and pushed cultural boundaries at every turn. The show even technically featured the first interracial kiss. The reason why I say technically is because he's mind controlled and to get around the censorship boards, they don't actually like pucker their lips. They just put their lips together. A little disappointing in hindsight. Like I know that they were doing the best they could in the 60s, but like Michelle Nichols is amazing looking, man. Just plant one on her. Let's go. Yeah. And also just the idea of like the only way that a, a, a white can kiss a black is if he's like mind controlled. That I believe that's that episode is Plato's stepchildren. I believe that's that episode. And that episode's fucking weird. He also gets mind controlled into thinking he's a horse and Spock dances and plays the Vulcan lute. Uh, if memory serves. Uh, yeah, that, that episode's fucking weird. After the show ended, Shatner fell on hard times. It was difficult for him to get cast in any serious projects because everyone just saw him as the guy from Star Trek. His money ran out almost overnight. Shatner refers to this time period as that period in his life. He was constantly on the grind looking for new jobs, sometimes even stooping to do dinner party appearances. Most of the acting work he was able to scrape together during this period was in the B-movie arena, with roles in films like The Devil's Reign, Kingdom of Spiders, and The Horror at 37,000 Feet. Always the fear. It's anxiety-making. So if you ask me, what would I say to that guy? Uh, so long ago. I mean, the 50th anniversary is next year. 50 years I would have been going on that stage. And, and so I would have said to him, uh, you see, you, you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to worry. But at the same time, in, in the 1970s, there, there was a period there where you were you were living out of the back of a truck as well. So well, I was. There's ups and downs. Well, uh, uh, ups and downs, absolutely. But I was living out of the back of a truck because... Uh, Star Trek was cancelled. It didn't pay very well to begin with. Uh, I just was gotten a divorce, which took all the money that I had been able to save, and three children. And so I was broke. And I was doing summer stock. Do you have summer stock in Australia? It's, no, but it's like it's like summer theatre productions. Summer theatre yeah. productions, but within 100 miles of each other, so that one week you're in a small town where people go to vacation, and then you're in another small town 100 miles away. Right. But I deliberately bought a shell to go on the back of the truck so I wouldn't have to go to a hotel. Uh, and I could make also make my food. I could save money. Yeah. I was living out of a truck uh, for a while after Star Trek. Were there moments where you're just like, this doesn't feel right. I made this sort of iconic show and now I'm doing this. Were there moments where you it felt like there was a disconnect? Well, absolutely. I remember thinking people say, oh, look, Captain Kirk, how are you? And I'm thinking all my kids sitting around the table and they're all going, <laughs> I gotta feed my kids. I gotta do summer stuff. I gotta feed my children. I, I have a couple of questions. I'm curious about your opinion on a few things. Interestingly, and I don't know if you agree with this, but I feel like I feel like William Shatner and Mark Hamill kind of had like similar careers in that regard, like oddly similar, where they really just they made those movies and TV shows respectively. And like they really were just known as like, oh, that's just Luke Skywalker and that's just Captain Kirk. And they were like not taken seriously in that in that way where it's just they were just those people and they to a certain degree didn't rise out of that. Now, I feel like between the two of them and this is like not this is disregarding like the later like more recent years where like Mark Hamill got to be in the new Star Wars movies. I'm not even like 
forget that part. But before that, oddly enough, I feel like William Shatner, I feel like in in the pop culture zeitgeist, he feels like he is regarded as more iconic, like him as an actor and who he is as Captain Kirk. It feels more like it, it feels more canon and iconic than Mark Hamill is as, as as Luke Skywalker. And yet I feel like overall Luke's uh, uh, Mark Hamill has had like a more fruitful post Star Wars career. No, not at all. So after Star Trek ends fallow period where he's in a bunch of these B movies that you're talking about. And then he has this huge career resurgence in the seventies with TJ hooker, which today may not be regarded as like the pinnacle of artistic achievement, but at the time was a very successful TV show. So now that's two named characters that he has that people generally know. Mark Hamill only has Luke Skywalker. Then the movies come back and he plays Captain Kirk in not just the TV show, but seven, seven feature films over the course of like a decade and a half. Again, not comparable to Mark Hamill. Does Mark Hamill have a very lucrative and highly successful voiceover career? Yes, good for him. That's amazing. Shouldn't be taken away from him. He's the fucking Joker. He's great. But that's not the same as either of those two accomplishments. And then Shatner comes back for the third, the hat trick. Boston legal, baby. He got nominated for a fucking... I completely, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, he like had like legit like syndicated TV money. And then on top of that, he has two other careers. He's also a highly famous, lucrative genre novelist. He's written, I mean, does he actually write these books? No, he ghost, he gets ghost writers. But, you know, his name is on all these books. Tech War. There's like 10 Tech War novels that spawned video games and a TV show and a made for TV movie. And he also uh, has multiple franchises of his own that have never spawned movies. And also he was one of the main novelist writer, you know, uh, guiders of certain eras of the Trek novels. He wrote a whole series of reboot novels prior to, again, did he actually write them? Fuck no. He like sat in a room and somebody else was like, Bill, we got this idea. And he's like, yeah, it sounds good. Put my name on it. But highly lucrative novelist. And then on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, he's like a Grammy award winning musician. Like he has like 10 records. Are they good? Mm, You know, your mileage may vary. He kind of just talks over music, but the dude's got nominated for awards and they've made a lot of money. So like, again, I don't know that that's the same as comparing it to Mark Hamill, who's great. I love Mark Hamill. I'm not shitting on that guy, but I don't know that his... Dark Horse comic, The Black Pearl, is equivalent to like 15 novels and 10 studio records as like an extracurricular hobby. You know what I mean? Yeah, see, I I mean, because number one, I was sort of talking about like post Star Trek and TJ Hooker. Um, But also, number one, I forgot about Boston Legal, which that alone, like you get you get syndicated TV money in your fucking set. And also and also, you know, I made that joke earlier in the episode, but I think it's true That him being the Priceline guy also was this big thing where he was kind of a meme for a minute. And like, you know, he it's really impressive to me that William Shatner just continually reinvents himself over and over and over and over again. Yeah. But also, I had no idea. I had no idea that he wrote books or pretended to write books like that. I had I had zero clue about that. Yeah, he absolutely definitely has his name on a shitload of books that he had nothing to do with. Uh, In fact, he has a new book out right now called Boldly Go, which was then adapted into a nature TV show called Boldly Go. Um, I just went to the I just went to the uh, Star Trek convention in Las Vegas. And because he can't talk about Star Trek there, he gets up. Dude's 92 years old, just flew in from New York that morning, which is so crazy. 92 years old. He gets up there. He's talking about how he, 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 when he plugged his phone in, it wouldn't charge. And he didn't think he was going to be able to get on the plane because his tickets were on the phone. And then he gets there and he doesn't have anything to talk about for Star Trek. So he starts talking about his book, Boldly Go, and all this science stuff. And he literally just riffs about like mycelial networks and how mushrooms and trees talk to each other for like 20 minutes. And it was just like word salad. And I loved it. I loved every moment of it because he was just like, and then 
the trees. They talk to the mushrooms. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just outstanding? Don't you wish you could talk to the mushrooms? And you're, I'm like, yeah, I do wish I could talk to mushrooms, Bill. It's amazing. You're 92 years old. Yes, I, I can't believe that you're standing, let alone that you flew in from New York this morning. This is shocking. Actually, this is this is the this is the perfect slash only time to ever bring this up or talk about this. And maybe this is a little bit of that, even though I even though I don't fully believe how passionate of a fan of Star Trek you are based on your performance. But uh, maybe it's a little bit of that influence rubbing off. But the audience won't know this. But when you when you read scripted things like for the for the show, whenever you read from like not just talking, but when you read from the script. You have this really strange cadence of where you put pauses and it's like it's very William Shatner esque. And I have to like go in and like edit to like get rid of like places where you've just like in the middle of a sentence, you pause at like very odd spots. Like I'm like I'm like I'm trying to do something dramatic and it's coming off weird or I'm just like processing and mentally figuring out where I'm at and pretending like I'm pausing. I mean, maybe a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, but you'll be like, you'll be like, but nothing can keep a hardworking man down. Like you'll, you'll just, you'll, you pause at strange places that I, that I have to edit to make it sound normal. Look, baby, you know, I mean, uh, maybe I'm just going to school uh, at the Shatner University of Dramitas, the Dramitas Personae. And that's the point is I, I'd like to believe that you are paying homage to William Shatner and not just that you can't read. Uh, it's probably a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Uh, yeah, I love I love William Shatner. I love Kirk. Uh, I don't really care about T.J. Hooker. Uh, I've read, I think I've read two, maybe three of Shatner's novels, uh, in air quotes, novels. I was just going to say, really, you can keep on, but I was just going to say, and this isn't like, this isn't like an ACAB thing because I was a kid. Like I had no conception of that, but I've never had any interest in a show. And this is like a weird, I don't know what, I don't know why I love a lot of detective shows, any show where the characters are cops in uniform, I do not care. But if it's a private eye, then you're into it? Yeah. I, yeah. Because like I said, this isn't some like, oh, I hate fucking cops and shows or whatever. Because I, t- I love tons of fucking detective shows and shows about plain clothes cops and things like that. But any show, like I, ne- I, I watch Chips a little bit, but I just was never into Chips either. Any show where the, where the characters are cops in uniform, my eyes just glaze over. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I have an opinion one way or the other. Like, like what about Miami Vice? Because they're clo- plain clothes, then it's not a thing. You like the show? Yeah, the, I don't. It's just something about the aesthetic of it. I'm just not into it. I would have thought the um, pet alligator would have been more of a stumbling block than. No, I I love the pet alligator. Yeah, Elvis his his pet alligator Elvis Sonny Crockett's pet alligator Elvis. That was like obviously a weird thing in the 70s where everything was like, oh, you have like a a, a strange animal sidekick. Like any any which way but loose and stuff like that was just yeah I mean they get rid of Elvis like basically halfway through the first season if my memory serves correctly they're just like yeah we're tired of dealing with this we don't want to do this in the same way that they also kind of like you know he has that will they won't they thing with the uh, with the hippo yeah with the with the hippo yeah no he has like because the pilot is him getting divorced and because he wants to fuck a hippo the rest of the first season goddamn you the rest of the first season is like kind of him in this will they won't they thing with this woman in his precinct and then they also just kind of drop that at a certain point too they're like eh people aren't here for this let's just have them drive fast to pop songs okay i love i love miami vice but nothing can keep a hard-working man down i guess shatner would roar back to cultural prominence multiple times over his career from his cop drama tj hooker to his shockingly early 2000s lawyer drama boston legal to his return to playing captain kirk in seven feature films Shatner became someone as known for his cultural reinvention and talk singing cover songs and writing shitty science fiction novels as for playing his iconic characters. However, fame and fortune could not protect William Shatner from the chaos theory of pain and suffering, as before he knew it, his third wife would befall a fatal tragedy. Act 
two, every life is touched by tragedy. Over his 92 years, Bill Shatner had four wives. Gloria Rand from 1956 to 1969, Marcy Lafferty from 1973 to 1996, Noreen Kidd, who we're going to talk about extensively, and Elizabeth Martin, who he recently divorced in 2020. Okay, listen, you might you may not have felt the same way about uh, as I did about Shatner versus Mark Hamill, but one thing you cannot disagree with is between the two of them, William Shatner is the definitive I am divorced guy. Oh, 100%. Who gets divorced at 92 years old? A guy who lives to be divorced. Like like his face just screams, I'm divorced. He's got I'm divorced energy. I'm so curious what the reason behind his most recent divorce is. Because, look, do I want anything bad to happen to Bill Shatner? No. Does he seem like he's a lot to handle and being married to him would be kind of rough? Yes. But he's 92. Like even, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be crass this way, but even as a pure business decision, he has some money. He's 92 years old. You can't tough it out for a couple more years. Yeah, some shit's got to go down for you to to actively go through with getting divorced from somebody who, if you just waited two years, you would inherit like a billion dollars. Again, I'm not trying to be shitty, but like he's 92. And is he spry and surprisingly with it and able to hold conversations and get on a plane by himself and travel from New York to Las Vegas in one day and then get up and talk for an hour? That's crazy. I don't know. I could do that. And I'm a third of his age. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like him and him and Dick Van Dyke. It's like, what the fuck? Like Dick Dick, Dick Van Dyke's almost 100. And he's just like, he's I feel like he's more energetic than I am. Just pure, probably just pure genetics. Like, it's not like, oh, they do something special. Like, they probably just hit the lottery of like, I just retained a lot of my dexterity and energy in my old age. I'm just so curious if it's like, if his wife is divorcing him, if he's divorcing his wife, if there's a third person in the picture, if there's four people in the picture, like what is the deal here that leads you from being like, let's just fucking, let's just calm down, Bill. Let's just, let's not get a divorce. Let's just hang out. All right. Let's just fucking hang out, bro. And also, didn't they like, didn't, is this somebody else? Didn't they like get back together after already being divorced? No, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're back together. Oh, my God. They're they're together right now? Yeah. William Shatner has reunited with his ex-wife, Elizabeth Martin, three years after their two million dollar split. I guess I guess cooler heads prevailed. Yeah, I guess she I guess she really I guess she had some time to to reflect on what you said. And she's like, wait a minute. What the fuck am I doing? I better get back. I, I got to get back in on this shit like in enough early enough to where it doesn't seem like I just got back together with him like two months before he died for that sweet, sweet inheritance money i gotta put in a little bit of time i mean i guess it was it was just that it was that it was that 2020 stuck together in a fucking room with somebody 24 7 yeah that's why that's why they were able to get back together because he's on the road constantly doing shit when they were trapped in the same house she was just like oh my god you're fucking horrible to be around all the time dude i think i think i think anybody even the even the best of people even the best of relationships like 2020 was a was a trying time i'll, I'll just I'll just uh, I'll just say that much. Yeah, I mean, I know it was for you and I, you know, we we barely spoke to each other for a while after 2020. Yeah, I mean, it's just and it's just it's a it's a it's an adjustment period like it's but, you know, whenever you you finally know somebody for for real, whenever you are stuck in a treehouse with them. Wait a minute. No, that doesn't make sense. I'm Spandrew. No, this is this 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 isn't this isn't canon. This doesn't work into the fucking lore. Noreen Kidd, the future third Mrs. Shatner, was born in Boston, Massachusetts to June and Warren Kidd Sr. Mr. Kidd was employed as a longshoreman and June worked as a secretary. Noreen was the second of five children. As a young person, she enjoyed boating, water skiing, and taking long walks on the lakes of Sandown, Sandown, Sandon. Yeah, it's probably Sandon, those fucking weird ass New England people with their fucking weird pronunciations of shit. And they get all mad at you when you say it wrong and they're just like, it's pronounced Sinlaw. It's like, fuck you. 
I'm saying it how it's spelled, you asshole. And taking long walks around the lakes in Sandon, New Hampshire, where her family would vacation. Noreen was known for being highly vivacious as a young person and a very attractive young woman. She was discovered by Janet Shute, a modeling agent in the greater Boston area. She was unusual looking, raw and unrefined. Noreen quickly developed a modeling career and traveled to New York, Europe, and eventually Los Angeles. She placed as the runner-up in the Miss World competition and also appeared in a brute cologne ad for the Smell of a Man product. For every man who wears brute, there's a woman who loves what he smells like. Because there's something about brute that's nice to be close to. And nobody knows that better than a woman. Brute. It smells like a man. Hello? Honey! I was just thinking about you. Brute. It smells like a man. (laughs) Huh. Well, I, I feel like, I mean, I was... We've 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 lived for a while. We've been we've been alive since the late '80s, so it's not like we didn't live through it. But it's just it's like I'm not even saying this a way of like oh the, the patriarchy or whatever, but just like in a modern lens, it's just it's so alien to me. Like that doesn't seem appealing to me at all to anybody. I can't imagine who would who would find it appealing of like perfume that smells like a man. Like who who would want that man or woman? I don't even really know what that means. What does a man yeah, smell? Yeah, I don't know. It's just, I, and I, and the, the, what I'm saying is like at the time, I think that that was an appealing concept because it, everything was centered around like, oh, men and, you know, women want men and blah, 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 blah. But in a modern lens, it's like that doesn't sound appealing to me at all. It smells like a man. So it smells like just some guy's body. I don't – who wants that? Yeah, that's not that's – not, that's not chill. <laughs> that's not chill. The uh, the the big thing that was a turning point in her career though is that she meets um she meets Bill Shatner uh while working. Yeah, I'm calling him Bill now on on the nickname basis. Calling him Bill. Oh baby, Bill and I we go way back, man. We're tight. We're tight. You helped him kill his wife. We're getting married, bro. We're getting married in 2024. He's getting another divorce, and then we're gonna get married. So he she also appeared in the TV show William Shatner's A Twist in a Tale, which is like a kids TV show. Hello, I'm William Shatner. What a wonderful business this is. You can be an actor, a writer, a director, a producer. You can be a captain of a starship or a cop on the beat. No matter what job I've taken or what part I've played, at the end of the day, I'm a storyteller. And now I'm part of an exciting new television production of quality children's programming and family entertainment. Fifteen one-hour tales of imagination and wonder. William Shatner's The Twist in the Tale. Come on, I'll show you. For I am the storyteller. Magic. Do you remember the tale of the Emperor's new clothes and who was the only person in the city who could see magic? You can see this, this girl here. You can see her, like, look at the camera, like, are we filming? Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is the best part of this is Shatner's reading off of cue cards this entire time. This fucking Mickey Mouse operation. Do you remember the tale of the Emperor's new clothes and who was the only person in the city who could see that they weren't really there? A child? Well, I believe that children are given a simple gift, a gift of sight. It's a gift that we older people later lose along the way. You see, young people can see what's really there without a lifetime of beliefs and superstitions getting in the way. They can see things that are not always what they see. Sometimes what children see stagger your imagination. These kids do not look into this at all. No, they really don't. Supernatural stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things that happen to them. He's also not looking in the camera. He's just reading. It's this. The eye lines of this are just making. Yeah, well, he's going back and forth, like where he's sometimes he's come to, he's sometimes looking directly into the camera, and then he's sometimes like looking up into the middle distance, and then sometimes looking at the kids. Shall I tell you about a few? Yes, please. 
Okay. Here goes. Close your eyes. And imagine. The strange world is not where men are ready to kill in the name of love. Where in the name of love we swear vengeance. Yeah, so she, she had a role on this show. Noreen and Bill met in a Toronto hotel bar during the filming of the TV series Kung Fu. Shatner and Kidd engaged in a brief conversation before meeting each other officially a week later. They became fast friends, and a romance quickly blossomed. However, it wouldn't be until much later when it became apparent that Noreen had a darker side. She was caught driving under the influence after picking up Shatner's daughter from a spa in Palm Springs. She exited the freeway and slammed on her brakes, nearly causing an accident. She promised Shatner that she would not have a repeat of this incident on the date of their wedding. Basically, she picks up his kid, his daughter. She's driving her back to L.A. They have to get off the freeway at a certain point. But because she's slightly inebriated, she almost causes this huge accident and gets pulled over. And it's a whole thing. And she ends up promising, I'm sorry, Bill, I'll never drink and drive again. You know, especially when the daughter's in the your daughter's in the car. Like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I mean. I don't I guess I can't exactly say like what would happen if you were in a situation where you were like in love with somebody and something like that happened. So I can't 100 percent say this with certainty, but I feel like like that's a deal breaker, like immediately. I don't care. Like I said, I can't fully confirm this because emotions get tied up in things and sometimes you compromise based on what your heart is telling you or whatever. But somebody that I'm like newly in a relationship with. And they drive drunk with my child in the car. Like, it's just, it's over. It's like fucking done. Uh, And so Shatner pushes the wedding out six months. Five months later, she's caught driving under the the influence again. And this time she's arrested. Um, And then at this point, Leonard Nimoy kind of approaches uh, Shatner after a dinner party where she was drunk. And he's basically like, hey, Bill, like, she's an alcoholic, man. We need to get her some help. Like, you probably maybe might want to think about not marrying this person. And Shatner... You don't know what you're saying, Spock. Yeah, Spock, you don't know what you're trying to say to me. There's also something just funny to me about Spock approaching you and trying to, like, tell you that your wife is is an alcoholic. I don't know why that's funny to me. I mean, Leonard Nimoy seemed like... Look, do I love William Shatner? Yes. Do I also find him very annoying and stupid and frustrating? Yes. Leonard Nimoy is the living embodiment of unproblematic fave. Like, he's a fucking saint. Like, sure, did he have a little bit of a raucous relationship with his son? Yes. But, like, that's human. He didn't cheat on his wife. He didn't do anything weird. He never touched anybody inappropriately. He was just out here making art, man. Being a cool dude. Directing Three Men and a Baby. Directing Three Men and a Baby 2. Directing Star Trek 3 and 4. The most unproblematic thing you can do is direct Three Men and a Baby. That's what I'm saying, man. Despite the warning signs, Shatner and Kidd were married on November 15th, 1997 in Pasadena, California. Nimoy was the best man. At the wedding, Shatner opened his speech by saying, When it is dark and there's trouble, you need to wave that bauble and there will be light. He then read a poem that he wrote and pledged his undying love to Noreen. Noreen pledged her sobriety. That's when you know you got problems. When at the at the wedding reception, she's like, I promise I will not drink. Trouble in paradiso. That's what I would have said at the, if I was at the wedding. If I was sitting at the table, I would have leaned over to you and went, trouble in paradiso. <laughs> I like the idea that we're each other's date to Shatner's wedding. Of course we are. The fuck? Tragically, her pledge did not last the night. She woke up drunk the next morning. Attendees at the wedding said that she consumed several bottles of vodka. Shatner promptly installed a blood alcohol meter in his car to keep her from using it while under the influence. I mean, once again, that's when you know you got problems every step of the way. It's like, bro, you're within like months of being with this person. They drove drunk with your kid in the car. The, 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 like sign signs of trouble ahead she's pledging her sobriety at the wedding red flag red flag red flag you have to install a a special contraption in your car that makes it impossible for a drunk person to drive it red flag red flag red flag like (laughs) you're you're ignoring all the red flags the most clear red flags i've ever seen in my life there's nothing subtle about this when you're when you're fucking adding inventions to your car you you take it as a sign 
Yeah, and and it's like you said, you know, when your emotions get wrapped up in this and you love someone and you want to help them, you know, you you just start spiraling out and then you get locked in this trauma cycle where you're like trying to help someone who doesn't want or isn't capable of accepting help and then you start hating them for not being able to be the person that you love and it's it's just this vicious cycle, man. It's so fucking brutal. That might be the 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 most human thing uh ever about us is like we are people who want like when when we when we see somebody that needs help we desperately want to help them and we will kind of ignore a lot of things and make a lot of excuses out of the hope that we can eventually help them but we were also we are also people that will not and cannot be helped unless we want to like there's nothing in the world that can get a person to accept help unless they want it even if they're like on the verge of death, even if they're causing a lot of pain and a lot of damage and trauma to other people, you will go out of your way to not be helped unless you unless you want to. You, you can't be forced to be helped by anybody. These measures weren't enough, though. Reports indicate that within three months of their marriage, Shatner informed Noreen that he was filing for divorce. She didn't take this well. The couple separated October 11th, 1998 until October 21st when they reconciled. Shatner offered to drop the divorce if Kid went to rehab. She had previously been in rehab three separate times for stints of 30 days each. They didn't work, unfortunately. Even more disturbing, though, she had attempted to drink herself to death twice more before her recent bout of alcoholism. And uh, here's where, yeah, here's where things are about to get real dark. This is the 911 call that William Shatner placed to the uh, Los Angeles Police Department after coming home and discovering. On August 9th, 1999, William Shatner returned to his home in Studio City, California to find his wife, Noreen, floating lifelessly in the deep end of their pool. Before pulling her out of the water, he made a desperate 911 call. Oh, what's your problem? Shut my wife at the bottom of the pool. Okay, did you get her out of the pool yet, sir? No, I'm not yet. Okay, I want you to take her out of the pool right now, sir. I'm going to take her. She's up the very deep end. Okay, sure. Okay, if you can, grab something to get her out of the pool. Yes, sir. 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 An autopsy later revealed that she had a blood alcohol concentration of 0.27, as well as sleeping pills in her system. Her face was bruised and her neck was cracked. Her death was ruled an accidental drowning. Uh, you know, this is where this is where things get pretty dark. Um, you know, as as you heard from the video, the the fact that his wife passed away in this unconventional setting which may or may not have been suicide, um, and the fact that her face was bruised and her neck was broken um, made people start to think that she had been attacked by Shatner. Uh, and then... Another part of it, which I think maybe we'll talk about more in a second, but just from this 911 call is... Another aspect of it is people already think of actors as being like fake and hiding things and being insincere. Shatner himself has this very kind of odd way of communicating, which I think can get tied up in people misinterpreting potentially, or maybe interpreting correctly, but p potentially misinterpreting just his tone and way of speaking as being insincere because it's just not a normal way of communicating. And also just things which I think are potentially tied up in just the way he expresses himself. But like in that 911 call, for instance, whenever he, he, they answer the, call, the phone and he says, my poor wife is in the pool, like saying my poor wife, like at least to me, it, it sounds performative where it sounds like a character in like an episode of Columbo who's just got finished murdering somebody and then like calls on the phone and pretends to be upset. Because it's like, why would you say my poor wife? That's just a, that's an odd thing to say in the moment. Like if I was calling the police, I would just say like I would just say like my wife is in the pool. I, I wouldn't go out of my way to be like my poor, beloved, dear wife. So it feels performative, but it could be performative, as we'll discuss more, 
Or it could just be that he's just an odd guy who expresses himself in a strange way that most people don't, you know? Yeah. And also, like, who the fuck knows what you would do in that scenario? Like, who knows what you would do? You know, like, I I, I have no idea how I would react in that. I would that would be very a, di- a very difficult situation. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's we have this Los Angeles Times article here from 1999 uh that i'm gonna have you read and then we'll discuss the whole thing afterwards studio city final autopsy results show that noreen shatner the wife of star trek star william shatner had been drinking heavily and taking sleeping pills the night she drowned in the swimming pool behind her home the former model and aspiring actress who had two drunk driving convictions and had been treated several times for alcoholism had a blood alcohol level of 0.27 percent more than three times the legal limit of driving according to the autopsy report released tuesday Doctors found bruises on her face and two cracked neck vertebrae that indicated she dived into the pool, banged her head on the bottom, and lost consciousness. The findings help explain what occurred the night of August 9th when William Shatner returned to his hillside mansion in Studio City and found his wife naked at the bottom of the pool's deep end. Noreen Shatner, 40, was known to drink a cocktail of Gatorade and vodka before swimming and had been struggling especially hard with her alcoholism in the days leading up to her death, Shatner told police. The autopsy supports authorities' initial belief there was no foul play, said Mike Coffey, the Los Angeles police detective investigating the case. The totality of the whole investigation indicates an accident, Coffey said. Drinking was definitely a problem for her. Everyone knew she was an alcoholic. She just couldn't beat her problem. Although never a suspect, Shatner, best known for his role as Captain Kirk in the Star Trek TV and film productions, was questioned several times by police, Coffey said. Shatner provided a time-stamped restaurant check to show he was dining in San Clemente with his daughter at the time of his wife's drowning, Coffey said. Noreen Kidd, her maiden name, wasn't destined for fame, though she was determined to find it, her family said. With a thick accent and streetwise ways, they said she left her blue-collar neighborhood in Boston at 17. She was a typical girl from a working class family who knew nothing about the business, said Janet Shute, the Boston modeling agent who said she taught Noreen to refer to photographs as headshots and not pitches. But she was spirited, she said, and in a business where there's lots of deadheads, she really stood out. It was not long before Noreen was walking down runways in Europe, shooting commercials in New York and flying her younger sister in from Boston in a helicopter she chartered with her own modeling money, the Times was told. Family photos with written captions on the back trace her rites of passage, which could have been those of anyone's youth. Ex Miss 1976, a pouty stare at the camera, a teddy bear in her arms, mother and daughter towering over mom in dated plaid bell bottoms, and prom night, her beauty clear by this point, her date's bow tie crooked. Leggy blonde with an upturned small nose, Noreen Kidd never quite emerged as a Cosmo talent, but she mixed with them. One of her beautiful friends, Suzanne Gregard, was once married to Dodi Faid who died at Princess Diana's side two years ago. Shifting from modeling to acting, Noreen moved to L.A. in 1985 and began auditioning for commercials. She landed a spot for a cologne and starred in a straight-to-video film shot in Yugoslavia that was never completed. She dated older men, her family said, including a man who raced cars and another who designed yachts. Five years ago, she met Shatner, 28 years her senior, on the set of the TV show Kung Fu The Legend Continues. They wed in 1997 at a ceremony in Pasadena. Younger sister Janine shared a dance with best man Leonard Nimoy, Shatner's fellow Star Trek actor. My hands were shaking, Janine Kidd said. I was a wreck. Brother Warren, a hospital orderly, said he ate so much sushi he almost popped. To a working class family, being connected to one of the most famous men on TV proved a surreal experience that ended before family members got used to it, Survivor said. Warren Kidd said he always called his brother-in-law Mr. Shatner. Shatner did not grant an interview for the story, but from what he has told police and others, There were signs Noreen was isolated and depressed. She wanted a baby, but Shatner didn't think she was responsible enough, according to Shatner's agent, Warren Cohen. Cohen also confirmed Shatner had filed for divorce, but the couple was making an attempt at reconciliation. On August 9th, Noreen Shatner was supposed to appear in Los Angeles Municipal Court for her last court date on a drunk driving charge from 1997. She never made it. I had called her the night before, and I couldn't understand a word she said, said Peter Necht, the lawyer who represented her. She didn't appear to be in good health. Her father, also named Warren, believes his daughter's life unraveled after she married Shatner. The father said he never approved of the marriage because he and Shatner are the same age. Brutal, man. Brutal. So another thing I think we need to kind of talk about is the, I think the reason why there's a kind of conspiracy theory surrounding her death and Shatner's potential involvement in it is that there was a lot of famous 
there was there's famous footage of him being interviewed in front of these trees. I'm assuming by his house. I don't know by you know paparazzi style journalisty types or whatever. And my understanding is that that footage comes off as very performative, um, and that people think it's not particularly genuine seeming. And the combination of that lack of genuine emotion in that interview thing, that roadside interview, and the fact that her face was bruised and her neck was broken led people to think like, you know, maybe he did fucking kill her. Maybe he killed her. Um, maybe he got frustrated with the fact that he, she just wouldn't accept his help and in a very human way snapped and became frustrated and broke her neck, strangled her, threw her down, whatever. And it took a left turn. And then, you know, maybe he put her in the pool, then went down to uh, Orange County to hang out with his daughter, came back and then, oh, my God, my wife. You know, that's the kind of conspiracy theory about what has happened. Obviously, the police police didn't think so. They interviewed him multiple times. The police, the autopsy reports didn't support foul play. Uh, The autopsy reports said we think that she was drunk and on sleeping pills and threw herself into the pool, like dove into it and hit her head on the bottom that's what cracked her neck um uh i wish we had that footage but m- it's been fucking scrubbed from the internet i don't i don't know why it's it's so difficult to find um i did every research trick i could think of you know finding you know screenshots of some of the footage and reverse image searching it on multiple pla- you know multiple search engines and yeah it just like literally does not exist other than there's like a shot of it in one of the videos we watched earlier. There's like a brief shot of like without sound, just him standing in front of the microphones talking and then walking away from the microphones. Other than that, it's just it's just not on the Internet. It's gone. And I'm I'm curious, you know, I'm curious why that is. Maybe people just don't care enough or, you know, yeah, I, I don't know why that doesn't seem like something that crazy that would be scrubbed from the Internet. You know, he's a major movie star and this is a big event in his life i don't know yeah yeah it's it's odd that it's so missing from the internet yeah i mean frankly it's it's really sad like it's really really sad you know that this this woman couldn't get the help that she needed couldn't overcome this disease that she was struggling with it's really sad that you know he went through this and was trying to help her and you know almost bend over backwards to the degree where it's kind of like you know maybe you shouldn't have done this stuff um but who knows what you would do in that situation? It's so hard when, you know, somebody is struggling with an addiction like that and you are just you're just trying to be there for them and they just can't not. Yeah, you're you're kind of powerless because, as I said before, you can't force somebody to accept help unless they want it. Yeah, it's really, really, really sad. The thing that stri- that sticks out to me about that article that we just read, uh, whether or not it was an accident or whether or not there was, you know, I, I don't know, not speaking to anything like that. But one thing I will say is that that article is weirdly spun in the negative to her. Like it goes out of its way to be like she was like a low class woman, like with a with a with an over the top accent. And she was like, you know, low class because she said pitches instead of headshots. And like it, it just it just like it was very it was very spun to make her to like make her seem like somebody who would be like a a degenerate alcoholic who would like kill herself like whatever whatever the reality of the situation was like there was definitely a concerted attempt to like make it seem like just in the just in the editorialization of that article that like Shatner was just this selfless guy who was like just wanted to help her and she was like a low class degenerate it's fucked up how those narratives get painted you know fucked up how that shit just kind of spirals yeah because like there's there's some details in there was just like why why would this even be in here why would you talk about her not be like saying pitches like that's that's a weird thing to add into this article unless you're just trying to overall paint her as this kind of like trashy person another thing is the the um once again whatever the actual reality of the situation is you can kind of tell what the general kind of court of public opinion it was about this because there's a there's actually an episode of monk which now knowing the story in retrospect i feel is directly referencing this um where there's this um 
famous procedural uh, actor who's like in this big detective procedural show. And he uh, is at his ex-wife's house and he kills her. He drowns. He 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 kills her and then puts her into the pool and then calls the cops and says that she drowned. And then he holds a press conference outside of the house where there's a bunch of reporters and he's like outside of the house and he's talking and he's like all emotional. And in retrospect, it was like 100 percent referencing this. Yeah, the I mean, this I wish we had that fucking video because I've only ever heard people describe it and I have seen little clips of it, but I've never seen the whole thing. Uh, and I, everybody I've ever seen talk about it says that it seems really disingenuous and he's not there. You know, he's not present in the way that you would think he would be or that he's not present in a way antithetical to he's in grief and trauma, blah, blah, blah. Like, it seems very calculated is what I've heard. Um and uh, it's a it's frustrating. I wish we had that, but apparently it's been fucking scrubbed from the internet. So if somebody finds it, somebody finds that shit on the internet, send it to us, and we'll record an addendum at the end of the episode, uh, talking about it and uh, re-upload the the episode with a little bit of us being like, well, okay, we've seen it now, and yeah, well, and and you know, here's the thing. Yeah, here's the thing about that because you know, I, I can just just knowing William Shatner's like how he is and also from that 911 call i can i even without seeing it i just can imagine what it's like like i kind of can just see what it's like and what people are talking about and why they're saying it's performative and it's like it's kind of like a you know it's it's i'm a i'm of two minds of it or it's almost like a schrodinger's cat situation because it's like i think that very it could very likely just be that William Shatner is an odd guy who expresses himself in a way that I think a lot of people are not. It seems strange to them. And it's all fun and games when it's just him going like this and it's a joke. But then when you see somebody acting like that, whenever they're talking about their wife dying for that to like strike you as strange and so suspicious, but it very well could just be that he's just, he just expresses himself in a strange way that, people just don't most people don't you know at the same time you know there's also the fact that stuff like this happens all the time and powerful rich men get away with things that other people wouldn't and things are scrubbed from the public consciousness by PR teams and you know I was literally just seeing this which apparently this is the case and this is a whole other can of worms that I'm almost I'm almost kind of like blindsiding you and the and the listeners with right now but apparently, like, in the 90s, Chris Rock just, like, raped someone. And then he hired this guy who's, like, a at the time was this professional, like, make something go away guy where he works. He's, like, he works with all these lawyers and all these PR people and, like, literal, like, mobsters to just, like, do this concerted PR astroturfing to, like, make the the woman seem like a liar, scrub everything from being talked about in the news, making sure that nothing gets, you know, no stories get written about it, making sure no no lawsuits get filed. And just like, basically, he's just like a fixer who just like makes something go away. And because he did this, people just don't know that Chris Rock had like rape accusations in the 90s, which I, which, wow, which, I had no idea, which was what, which, which like I was pretty blindsided by because I'd literally never heard of this before. And also I'm, I'm a huge fan of Chris Rock. Like I, I love his standup. Some of his standup specials are some of my favorites. I even kind of liked his more recent one that kind of had that like bit of like anti woke bullshit to it. I still thought there was some funny moments in that, even though it it's, it was, it's annoying when comedians now just like go on that whole, like you can't say anything anymore. Bullshit. That's like so annoying selective outrage is that what it was called yes even even that i i enjoyed despite some of the annoying stuff about it um because i'm just i'm just i've always been a huge fan of his so i was like totally taken aback by that um but th- th- stuff like this happens all the time you know the natalie wood type shit where it's like what the fuck happened there nobody knows only christopher walken apparently knows um so yeah it, it's like like i said it's schrodinger's cat like it, i i could see that William Shatner is totally innocent and he just had a his wife was just struggling with some really bad shit. And she unfortunately went too far past the point of no return, kind of like the Smash Mouth guy who just died like yesterday because of liver failure, because of alcoholism. 
But I could also see that a rich, powerful man could just make something go away, you know? Why do you take so much work on now? You know, specifically the, the Aftermath show. In, in Aftermath, I went back to the people who were affected in the news by, by the press and sought to find out what the aftermath was. Right. It was so fascinating. That, that show is so fascinating to me. How, is it, how much of it is connected to your own personal story? When, when your wife passed away, you got you got really hammered by the press. Well, not hammered, but no. Well, uh, enough no, questions. Yeah, that well, here, here, here's what happened with me. My wife died. I wasn't there. I come home, and, and there she is. Police come, declare it an accident within the hour. A tabloid, two or three days later, says to me through intermediaries that they're going to print a story where I, it was suggested that I had something to do with it. And they wouldn't do that if I gave them an exclusive. Yeah. So I made the decision then, I, I think I would do it now, but in the midst of grief, you, you, you don't know, you know, you're not in your right mind, but I think I would do it now. I said to them, I'll do it, but you have to pay me a lot of money. They paid me a lot of money. I gave that money. Uh, we formed a charity, and some of her friends contributed, Noreen's friends contributed, and we formed the Noreen Shatner Foundation mm -hmm. for Addicted Women. And over the years, many, many women have come up to me and said, if it wasn't for the Noreen Shatner Foundation, they wouldn't be alive. So, you know, that's kind of a nice thing. Um, I choose to believe that that is, I choose to believe that that is a selfless and magnanimous motivated thing and not performative guilt driven yeah just like just like i murdered my wife and now i'm gonna like form a fake or form a foundation to make it seem like i'm yeah i choose i choose to believe it's not that um spandrew looking at everything that we've talked about with this story uh what are your what are your closing thoughts yeah i mean i i guess ultimately i feel like he probably did not have something to do with her death i in my mind like at, at most, what may have happened is that they got into like a really big fight and he said some like really shitty things that kind of like maybe pushed her to do that. I'm not saying that happened, but I'm saying like in my mind, I feel like that's plausible that 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 may be something that may be something that he's hiding that like they had one last fight where he said awful things and told her that she should just like get it over with and kill herself or something. And then she did it. I don't, ne but but I don't necessarily think that happened. I think I, it seems to me like he was at dinner with his daughter, and then she dived into the pool, completely inebriated, and broke her neck on the bottom of the pool. Because, well, and and I, also I'd have to kind of know like how deep the pool was, because like you know you can dive headfirst into a pretty deep pool that's like you know ten foot or whatever. Maybe, well, maybe not ten foot. No, you definitely break your neck if you jumped into a ten foot pool, whatever twenty foot or whatever whatever the deep pools are. Like you can dive headfirst in and be fine, but if it was a kind of a shallow pool, like you can definitely jump in there and fucking break your neck like that, um, especially if you're like super drunk. So I kind of feel like, in my opinion, she was struggling with alcoholism and had an unfortunate moment where she either purposely or accidentally, while under the influence, either took her own life or accidentally jumped into a pool and broke her neck and died. Um, simultaneously, I, as I said before, just to kind of reiterate, like I could also, you know, I, rich, powerful men get away with crazier shit, um, or have gotten away with it or got away with it for a long time until they were found out. So I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility that this was just a big, uh, PR astroturfing and that he maybe had more to do with it than is being led on and that the conspiracy theories are accurate, but I kind of feel like it's not that it, I have no reason to believe otherwise, I guess. It's not like some Casey Anthony shit where it's like, she fucking did that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tend to feel similarly. Um, I think uh, I think that there's a there's also just a when someone is as theatrical and over the top as William Shatner is as a person and also as much of a known asshole as he is as a person, there is a desire to ascribe some sort of sinister or malevolent motivation behind, to that um, personality. Um, and, uh, I don't necessarily know that I think that that's true, but I think it's understandable why this is a conspiracy theory and why people think, you know, that there's foul play involved. Yeah. Which, which kind of, which kind of bugs me too, that, that, that outlook on things where it's like, if this person is an asshole, they probably are a serial killer. Like that's an insane leap in logic to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No argument. No argument here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, uh, I guess that's it for this episode. So I'll just say I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. If you'd like to find me on the internet, you can do so at heydavebaker.com or on the socials at xdavebakerx. If you'd like to pre-order my comic, Mary Tyler Moorhawk, that's a combination bizarre prose zines from 100 years in the future and adventure comic book graphic novel art project, you can do so right now at goldenapple.com. Get some free goodies with it, or you can do it on Amazon. Uh, as much as I don't like promoting that, uh, it makes it easy. So if you want to do that, you can do it there. It's just Mary Tyler Moorhawk. Um, I really have to come up with a succinct pitch for the book, but I don't have it other than like Buckaroo Banzai meets House of Leaves. So if that sounds like something that's cool, the book is coming out from Top Shelf, February 13th, 2024. Um, so please go pre-order it. Uh, Spandu, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, uh, Jeff Bezos told Dave that if he pre-sold enough books that he would let him come to space with him. So he's really he's really pushing for that. Um, you can find me meticulously editing out the Shatner-esque dramatic pauses from Dave's uh, narrative reading. And you can't find me on social media because I don't use social media. But if you want to pay your respects to the dear beloved proper proper prime free, then you can go to his website, dapricerights.com, and get his book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye. You can go to our shop, deepcutspod.com, and get some merch, hats, T-shirts with Deep Cuts stuff on it. Uh, Click on the shop. Uh, You can also follow us on social media by going to Facebook and searching Deep Cuts Podcast. Join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group where we talk about the show and make memes. You can join our Discord server, bit.ly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord, where we talk about the show, make memes, play games, and talk about other stuff. You can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod, TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content.